We're in episode 13, I think, of our study in 1 Peter. And we left off at our last episode, 1 Peter uh, chapter 4, verse 6. And um, let's go ahead and just start reading and see where this takes us. It probably won't take us very far, but let's read 1 Peter chapter 4, beginning of verse 7. The end of all things is near, therefore be alert and of sober mind so that you may pray. All right. So the end of all things is near. This is always um, a, an interesting discussion. When I was a kid, my great grandmother, who was Pentecostal, uh, I called her Mima, but her her uh, her name was Teresa Terry Teresa. Uh, she believed that Jesus was coming back in her lifetime. She looked at the world around her and said. Things are so awful. How could Jesus not come back tomorrow? And if she were alive today, uh, she would be horrified at some of the things that are going on today. I mean, literally, I don't know if she could even exist in some of the things that are going on today. She grew up, uh, she was born um, at the same time that uh, Queen Victoria was on the throne. And if you remember Victorian England, Victoria really transformed England and the United States and the world with her uh, very, very Victorian conservative attitude towards everything in the world. Uh, And we've, I've been, I'm still in the Victorian period, right? I'm, I still have a very, very, very conservative view on many, many things. And it all stems from Queen Victoria. Believe it or not, a monarch can lead and she did. Um, and and England and the United States and pretty much the Western culture followed Victoria. It, it's it's and she, my great grandmother, is very Victorian, and uh, and so she believed that Jesus was coming back uh, almost immediately. Well, she died uh, in eighty six, eighty seven, eighty eight. So she's been gone almost thirty uh, thirty five years, and um, Jesus hasn't come back yet. And my grandmother was similar, like, how can anything, you know, how could it, how could Jesus not come back? And um, the fact is, is that the disciples thought that Jesus was coming back soon. Um, Here, Peter's talking about the end of all things is near. Well, what's the end of all things? I think the end of all things is that Jesus uh, you know, the trumpet sounds, uh, Jesus comes back, the dead rise, there's judgment, and we live with Jesus forever. And, and Peter, just based upon what I read here, I think Peter thought that was going to happen in his lifetime. Uh, and it didn't happen in Peter's lifetime, and it didn't happen in John's lifetime, and it didn't happen in the early church lifetime, and it hasn't happened yet in my lifetime. And I think that there's there's an amount of, Jesus says, be prepared, right? You don't know when the last day is going to happen. So, you know, be like a uh, be, be like a bride who's waiting for her bridegroom to return. And uh, so I think we need to live as if it could happen today, like right now. But it's 2,000 years and it still hasn't happened. So the, w- the way I think about this, whether or not it's theologically correct or not, I think it is not necessarily theologically correct. Well, I mean, I don't think it's against Scripture or what Jesus taught, is that we need to be prepared anyway. We need to be prepared that he's coming, but also we need to be prepared that we could see Jesus today, that um, that something could happen to us today. I, you know, I could, I could step outside and a meteor would fall on me and um, I would die, and this world would continue going on for a period of time. But I would be safe in the arms of Jesus uh, in a timelessness, and then the the last day happens, and the the dead shall rise, and I will be with Jesus. And so today I will be with Jesus. If a meteor hit me today, because in my mind, you know, I'm dead, but then I'm alive with Jesus. So it seems like it's today, and yet um, a period of time could have passed. Uh, but that is. Um, uh, that is not a bad way to, th- I would, I would, the end would be near for me. The end is always near for me because I'm not going to live forever. 
I guess that's maybe the best way to say it. The end is always near because we're not going to live to be a thousand years old. And at some point we will see Jesus very soon. And it could be today or it could be tomorrow or it could be, you know, I could live for another 10, 20, 30 years. I have no idea. But then the end is near. Um, and I do find it interesting. Uh, the, the one thing that I just find uh, that I wonder about, let me put it that way, is uh, do, do, do would Jesus, I believe heaven's going to be wonderful. There's no question that heaven's going to be wonderful. And I'm going to love being in heaven and being safe and secure in the arms of Jesus. But while I'm here on this earth, I want to serve him with every ounce of energy that I have. And I believe that when I get to heaven, the more I've served Jesus and built up treasures in heaven, the more I get to enjoy those treasures in heaven. Okay, so if Jesus came today, he would shortchange me of 20 or 30 years of serving him and building treasures in heaven. And um, am I going to be upset about that? Probably not because I'll be safe in the arms of Jesus. But on the flip side, um, I would get shorted a little bit that I guess I could potentially be upset about, but probably not because I'll be in the presence of Jesus. You won't be upset. But diminishing the number of treasures that I can have in heaven. Okay. So the interesting thing is, is but but we can't keep going as we are forever, right? Um, because at some point, the world or the universe becomes overpopulated. I don't know. But the interesting thing is, is that the, the world population is actually, many, many, many people believe that the world population is going to stabilize in this century, and it might even start reversing in this century. That's never happened in human history. I mean, I may live during the point at which world population may actually start to decline, which has never happened since the beginning of the foundation of the earth. Um, that, that many, many, many uh, people who study the population of the earth, there's a thing called a replacement population, a replacement fertility rate. And a replacement fertility rate means that every woman has 2.1 children. And if every woman has 2.1 children, then the population stabilizes. If women, on average, have less than 2.1 children, then the population starts to decline. This has been happening in Western culture for 50 years. We have actually do not have, we have a declining Western culture population. But the thing is, is that it's compensated by, I think, Nigeria, which has the highest uh, replacement rate of like seven children per, per woman. But the more economically, uh, the more economically strong a country becomes, the less their fertility, the less their replacement rate is. So um, the, many, the UN says it's going to happen next century, but I think there's other people that say it's going to happen in this century, where we'll actually have a decline in overall population. This is never. Well, I mean, it, it's happened. Because of pandemics, it's happened because of uh, a number of things, but uh, but it's never happened in human history before. So it's quite possible that the that the world population may start going down from seven billion. But then the thing is, is that if it starts going down from seven billion, let's say it gets down to five billion next century, um, there might be more impetus then for people to have more children because the we know that the Earth can support seven. So when it gets down to five, do, is there a strong desire then to, to have more than to? Right now, we have a population rate of what we are because Western culture says that we can't support any more people. So there are a lot of people that voluntarily don't have as many children. But if we know that we can support seven billion and we get down to five billion, will there be pressure to have more? Um, and so we'll live in this period of time probably for a couple centuries trying to figure out, okay, what is the optimum population? And maybe that gives us time to figure out, okay, can we colonize Mars? Can we colonize you know, other planets in our solar system? Will we learn how to get to other solar systems? Um, all these questions you know, that we have about the world because um, you know, God's got this plan and uh, how it all fits in the plan, I have no idea. But the one thing I know is that uh, Peter believed that the end was near. 
Because the way that Jesus talked, he's like, you got to be ready. You have to be ready for my return. And uh, his return hasn't happened yet. Um, but we have to, it's weird to think 2,000 years he hasn't returned yet, but that he could return any day now. And uh, if you look into the future, uh, you, we have to live our lives as if the end is happening tomorrow, today. We have to be alert and sober mind and pray so that we are ready for Jesus' return. We just have to always be ready for that. Um, all right, that's enough on that. Verse 8, above all, love each other deeply because love covers a multitude of sins. Um, actually, it's funny. I just preached on this a couple weeks ago. Um, and the reason why we need to love each other deeply is because love covers a multitude of sins. And there were two ways that I looked at this. The first is that if we personally love other people um, and build up our street cred, then if we by chance do sin in the left-hand kingdom, um, people will overlook it. Like if you are Mother Teresa and you do something that people are like, I can't believe she did that. But people would say, but it's Mother Teresa and she's she loves everybody deeply, so we're going to overlook what she did, right? Uh, we should all grow in our faith so that, so that people cover our sin. But the other is that uh, love is an antidote for hate in the world. And all the sins of the world, um, the only antidote is the love of Jesus. And that love covers the, the death and the poison of the world around us. And Jesus calls his church to redeem the world, to be his hands and feet in the world. Without his church, without grace, without mercy, without love, without serving other people, this world descends rather quickly into the abyss. And so the church needs to be the hands and feet of Jesus so that we love each other deeply deeply, so that it, it covers a multitude of the world's sins. Let me put it that way. And that, that was, see, I gave you in two minutes <laughs> what the sermon was all about. Um, we'll go on verse 9. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. So there you have it. We should use whatever gifts we have in the service of Christ, in the service of God in his church. We're the only hands and feet that God has. He, uh, he doesn't have, he's not revealed to us a plan B. Plan A is the church serves the world around us, and that's, that's the plan A. And there is no plan B that we've been aware of. Um, maybe plan B is that he comes again. I don't know. Maybe, maybe plan B is if the church doesn't work out, if the church doesn't redeem the world, then it goes down to the abyss and then everything falls apart. I don't know. Those are what all the apocalyptic movies are about, right? Mad Max, that, uh, that, there's, that things descend so terribly into the abyss that, that we, have, you know, we die as a, as a civilization. That, I hope, never happens. I mean, you can, you can visualize it because mankind is sinful, but that only happens if the church does not step up and show grace and mercy and serve other people. Um, that, that's just, and I don't see the church ever not doing that, unless the church is forbidden from doing that. If the church is ever forbidden from showing grace and mercy and serving the world, then we could go into the abyss. And that is, that is a possibility, I suppose. Use whatever gift you have to serve others. I don't know what gifts you have, um, but God has given you gifts and he's placed you on this earth uh, for a reason. And so we should serve God with whatever gifts we have for a reason. Um, this does not necessarily mean serving a church, a congregation. You can serve God uh, in the world. Uh, in you know, One of the reasons that a church exists is to pool our resources together to help mobilize people to serve the world around us in larger numbers. You can, do, you can serve in larger ways when you pull people together. And so the, a church, a congregation can do that. Um, but you can also serve God in, in, outside of a congregation. You can serve him um, in many, many, many ways. Uh, you can serve him by going next door to your neighbor when he's sick or she is sick and bringing them food or something like that. These are things that you can do to serve. Uh, and we are called to do that. Oftentimes, we get so comfortable with our church family 
that we typically think of service as only within the church family. When Jesus says, love your neighbor, we think of, okay, my neighbor is the people I worship with on Sunday morning. They are your neighbor. There's no question about it. But the neighbor also extends to people beyond your bubble. Uh, and we know that because of the story of the Good Samaritan. When, when, when the person asked Jesus, who's my neighbor? The guy said, well, you may think all your neighbors are all your fellow Jews living here in Jerusalem or living here in your community. But in actuality, your neighbor is actually the Samaritan, somebody outside of your bubble. Uh, you cannot live 100% exclusively in your bubble. It may feel like uh, that's who your neighbor is, but it, your neighbor is anybody you work with. Your neighbor is anybody in your neighborhood. Your neighbor is truly just anybody in need. So um, your neighbor could be uh, a anybody that is bleeding and hurt by the world's impact of sin in their life. Uh, and what I mean by that is that the world is a harsh and cruel place, and so the world is going to crush people. And, and your neighbor could be anybody that's being crushed by the world. If you have the ability to help a person that is being crushed, uh, then and, and God calls you to do that, that's who your neighbor is. And so you should use whatever you gifts you have. Why? Verse 11. If anyone speaks, they should do so as one who speaks the very words of God. If anyone serves, they should do so with the strength God provides, so that in all things God may be praised through Christ Jesus. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. So, the whole reason why we serve is so that the kingdom of God increases, that God is glorified. Um, when you speak words, when you are in the kingdom and you speak words, you're speaking the words of God. So if somebody needs the words of God, you have the ability to speak the words of God into somebody's life. Um, this is very powerful. Uh, it is not just me that speaks the word of God into people's lives. I do that on a regular basis and I'm paid to do that. But I am not the only one who has the capacity to speak the words of God to somebody else. If you're a manager or leader, you have the ability to speak the words of God to somebody who, who is in your, um, you know, uh, people that you lead. Um, if you, a, a good manager, have I said this yet? A good manager is a good pastor. A good manager is a good pastor. If you want to be a good leader of people, then take a look at what Jesus says about pastoral role and do those things in your life and become pastoral in your life and you will be a good leader. A good leader cares for the people they lead. Um, they, they serve at some level. They have humility, uh, the people they lead. Um, that is what a good leader... And even Harvard Business School, they did an article years ago, a research project, and said, what's the number one thing that people look for in a leader? And it was humility. Well, humility is not in large supply today, but a good leader is humble. A good leader serves a little bit the people he leads. Um, a good leader loves the people he leads. If one of the people he leads is in the hospital or their family's having issues, they, they come and they, uh, you know, they provide whatever they can as a leader and I learned this from my father. Um, my father owned an engineering company, and the people in his engineering company weren't just employees. They were extended family. And um, if, if one of them was sick, my father was there with them. If one of them had a need, my father used whatever resources he could at whatever level he could to kind of help fill that need. Um, he was like a, a super dad, I guess you would say, to the people in his employ. And that's the way it was, you know, 50 years ago as my dad ran his engineering company. I don't, I, I, and I learned just by watching and observing my father, I learned what it was like to be a good um, pastor. <laughs> because my father, and my, and my dad ended up becoming, you know, going through the deacon program and, and becoming a pastor. I mean, my dad... Uh, still to this day is very pastoral and loving and caring and um, and and but he it didn't happen you know uh, just at the end of his you know his career it happened very early in his career he just has always been a very loving caring person to the people that he had in his employ and uh, and that I've always felt 
that there is a huge, huge overlap between what a manager does, what a leader does, and what a pastor does. That a mid-level manager at some level is the exact same thing as a pastor. So if you want to learn uh, what it means to be a good mid-level manager, learn what it means to be a pastor. And if you want to be, learn what it means to be a good pastor, look at mid-level managers and see what they do. There's a huge amount of overlap. As a matter of fact, we have a program called Stephen Ministry, and Stephen Ministry is uh, teaches you in 50 hours of training how to how to care for people, how to love people, how to listen to people, and all that sort of thing. And I. Uh, believe with all my heart that if you want to be a good manager, not necessarily a manager that the world looks at today, because today's managers, uh, I could get into that story, but they want type A people that hire and fire to maximize profits. But if you want to be a manager that really cares about people, Stephen Ministry is an excellent, excellent program to go through to learn how to listen <clears throat> to other people. Uh, and management, mid-level management, is listening to other people. I mean, it truly is. I've said uh, for years that uh, my years as a manager at an engineering company, uh, it was just adult daycare. <laughs> it's basically listening to, he touched me. He, he used my stuff. He, we had this project, and he said he would do this, and he didn't do this, and so I had to pick up the pieces and blah, 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 blah. That's what mid-level management is, is basically adult daycare. It's, it's ba but, you know, life is adult daycare. Um, it's basically uh, a good manager, a phenomenally good manager listens to people. A phenomenally good manager is humble. A phenomenally good manager is, uh, serves the people that he, ser that he leads, right? Uh, I shouldn't say lead, manages, because there's a difference between management and leadership. Um, just the the really really quick the really really quick is managers say this is the process that we're following and we're going to follow it and i'm going to make sure you follow it and they have the process all buttoned down and um and they and they manage people to make sure that process happens leadership takes it to another level and says is the process good or is it bad or is it broken or needs to be fixed or do we need to go in a different direction and if we need to go in a different direction, a leader, a leader brings the whole team into a different direction uh, and deals with uh, people that are uncomfortable with going in a different direction. That's leadership. That's tough. Management is tough also, but it's tough in a different way. Management is more pastoral and caring for people and all that sort of thing. Leadership uh, also includes caring for people, but it's taking people to a new place that they haven't been before and getting them excited about it. That's leadership. And it's totally different from management, totally different skills. Um, and, I mean, a total, totally additional skills, let me put it that way. Uh, Jesus was a leader. <laughs> he took the world in a whole different direction through what he did. Jesus was the perfect leader. He was also the perfect manager, but he was also the perfect leader. Um, anyway, so I think we'll leave it there. Uh, not much, I mean, a lot of philosophical stuff in our, in our study today, but um, not, we didn't get very far. So uh, let's go ahead and close in prayer. Uh, gracious God, um, help us to serve you so that you can be glorified and be with us until we meet again. In your name we pray, amen.